It's been a really crazy week. Um, I'm going to try and follow, I, I manuscript my sermons for those that don't know, and today I haven't even had a chance to sort of like do highlighting and underlining that I normally do to help me keep track because I'm, I'm, I'm one of those guys that I'm walking along and every couple of minutes I go, squirrel! And uh, it's really hard for me to track stuff, so I always manuscript, and today I just, I feel so like I want to sit on the edge of the stage and just, you know, just talk. No, I... I I got this because I really feel that God wants me to, to, to go through this with you. And for a reason. I don't know if you remember, but last summer, I, I did a series called At the Movies. Does anybody remember that? And what we did in that series is I showed, uh, I showed some clips from some of my favorite movies. And, I, and we talked about the themes, the, the predominant theme in those scenes or in the film itself. And, and kind of how that relates back to our life of faith. Or how it relates to God working in our lives. Or, or how it relates to church and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we have a lot of fun with it. And it, I, I enjoy doing that stuff. And I really felt like we should do it again. In fact, we may do it. This may be a summer thing that we do. Um, and for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's fun. And, and let me tell you, I, I, am, am I wrong? But don't we need just a little bit of fun in our lives right now, especially ever after having gone through everything that we've been going through? So fun is a really good, honestly, if we can have more fun in service, I'm all for it. I think it's great spreading around the joy of the Lord with a great big grin on my face. It's one of my favorite things to do. But the second reason I, I really feel like we should be sharing this is, is honestly, it's because it's, it's a whole lot of who I am in the kingdom of God. See, I, I love Jesus, and, and I'm always kind of looking around in the world and in my life to see where he is and see what he's doing. You see, Jesus isn't just here. I think we get, we get trapped in this weird idea sometimes. People get this strange idea that, you know, you find the Lord at, at the church when you go on Sundays. Like, that's where, that's where God is. It's, it's his house. That's where he hangs out. It's not. I mean, it couldn't be further from the truth. He's everywhere. I mean, Jesus is, he's everywhere. He's, he's in the streets. He's in other people's homes. He's in the things that we do, even those little tedious things that we don't pay much attention to, or even the, the things that annoy us. He's there. And he moves, and he does stuff in our lives, and he's always kind of in motion, doing work. I mean, his spirit is alive and active in everything that we do. Scary thought. Maybe. So one of the things that I find that I do naturally, because I'm wired this way to always be looking for him, is I love looking for opportunities to find Jesus in the kind of the regular things that everybody does, whether they're a Christian or not. Just the everyday things of life, where's Jesus in that? And I love taking those things, like movies, and I like seeing, okay, so, so where is there a place where people can connect from this thing that they like so much? How can they connect that back to him or back to faith or back to the church or back to, right? This is a journey and it's exciting and people should know about it, shouldn't they? And so what I like to do often when I watch any movie pretty much within a couple of days as I, I spin on it usually for a couple of days after I've seen a movie is I start thinking about it. I think about the themes. I think about what the film is saying. I think about the stuff that's, that's getting the imagery of it and, and what people are picking up. And I start thinking, now, if I'm talking to somebody about that movie, where can I connect them to the church or to, to Jesus or to, to you know, a faith life or love? And so that's why I want to do this again. But here's the thing. To start our At The Movies summer series, I want to start with a TV show. <laughs> I know I'm, kind of, I'm kind of wrecking it right out of the gate. But the reason is, and I think it might be a little plain to you when you see where we're going with this, is that because technically, although technically it's a TV show I'm going to talk about, uh, the truth is because of uh, I mean, the, the quality of it and the impact that it's had, it is far more like a summer blockbuster film than it is a TV show. So we're going to have a little fun. We're just going to watch a clip from the film. Uh, it's kind of a mash montage because uh, it'll actually help get me where I'm going with this. So we're not watching just one scene. We're going to watch kind of like a little smattering with some music in the background. It's going to be great. You're going to have a lot of fun. Um, hold on to your seats. We 
Yeah, nothing in the house again, eh? Crank that up there. Do that again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so the Mandalorian is a series that was created by Disney that takes place for those of you that didn't catch it. Takes place in the Star Wars universe, and the story follows a, a bounty hunter by the name of Din Djarin, who's commissioned by a secret remnant of the evil Galactic Empire. And what he's commissioned to do is go out and track a target, and if possible, bring that target back alive. But when he finds this target, that little thing in his feet there, <laughs> when he finds the target, he discovers that it's just a small, helpless child. And as he begins to realize the evil intentions of the Galactic Empire, he instead rescues the child and takes the child to return the child to his people and to safety. And that's kind of the plot. It's very simple. He's gallivanting around the universe trying to protect this kid and get this kid to safety. Now, admittedly, the show is not for everybody. I get that, but I was born in 1970. I am a child of the 70s, therefore I am of the Star Wars generation. And for me, this show is like so stupid exciting, it's incredible. Right? Like, I can't get enough of it. I watch, I'll watch it over and over and over again. I love it. It's so much fun. Um, but the truth is, is that there's all kinds of stuff in this show that is really great stuff. There are all kinds of themes. I mean, this show is thick, and its writing is good. They talk about all kinds of stuff, like uh, the, the difference between good and evil, and they, and they talk about parenting or fatherhood more specifically. They, they focus a little bit on, on right and wrong and, and loyalty and sacrifice and friendship 
and courage. But, but this one theme that keeps coming back again and again and again and again is this, this theme of tradition. And it's actually rather strong in this show. You see, the bounty hunter, the protagonist of this story, the Mandalorian, uh, is a, um, he was adopted into a clan-based people group from the planet of Mandalore. That's where you get the name the Mandalorians, right? It's from the planet Mandalore. Often composed of members from multiple species, all bound by a common culture, creed, and code, tradition is thick and deep with the Mandalorians. And because of this deep tradition throughout the show, one of the things that you hear again and again and again is... This is the way. They say it all the time. In fact, it's become a pop culture reference, right? You can find bumper stickers about it. You can buy t-shirts with the, this is the way. It's like this this thing that everybody's saying now, but they're tweeting it on Twitter and they're putting it on their Facebook and they're doing all of this stuff that they do there right now. Everybody seems to be doing it. This is the way. But here's the thing. The show doesn't just have tradition in it and it, and it doesn't even just kind of talk about tradition, the show actually deals with one of the extremely difficult challenges that arises from unchecked tradition. Let me explain what I mean by that. You see, very near the beginning of this series, in fact, I think it's in the very first show, the very first episode, it's revealed that our protagonist, the Mandalorian, Din Djarin, cannot, may not, remove his helmet in the presence of other people. Now, obviously, he takes it off to eat and stuff like that. I'm sure he has a shower every once in a while. But he does that in private. He does those things away from other people's because no one is ever allowed to see his face. Maybe it's to keep him shrouded in mystery or whatever. I don't know. But that was it's kind of their thing. And every time someone inquires about it or, or asks to remove his helmet or if they can see his face, his explanation is always accompanied by those words. This is the way. Every time it comes up, this is the way. And the helmet stays on. And, I, and it's interesting. It's actually kind of a strange tradition, right? It's not something that you or I ever had or known anybody else to have, I don't think. But as I'm watching this show, as he's gallivanting around the universe trying to protect this kid, I keep thinking about, like, dude can't take off his helmet. Like, it's a weird thing. And it preoccupied my mind quite a bit. But then something happened in the second season that threw everything into a tailspin. Everybody's still tracking with me, right? Because we're going to go into more plot here. In chapter 11, what happens is, is that Din Djarin here, he comes face to face with another group of Mandalorians, which is actually kind of remarkable because at that point in his life, he was pretty sure that they'd all been wiped out and he was the last one. He didn't think there were any more. And then suddenly he runs into another group of Mandalorians, the leader of which, in the center there, is named Bo-Katan, and Bo-Katan is the rightful queen of Mandalore. So he's meeting this queen he doesn't even know existed. She's it, right? She's the one that decides. She's the rightful queen of the Mandalorians, and right after he meets them, they remove their helmets. <laughs> Wait, this is not the way. <laughs> so, and he, they have this exchange and they start talking about it. And this is the point in the story where you discover that he was orphaned as a young boy. And as that orphan, you saw the scene in the, the, that we watched where the Mandalorian reaches down, takes that small child out of the hole in the ground. That's him as a child being rescued by the Mandalorians. But it's, it's, a, it's this small sect that had split off from the rest of the Mandalorian culture And it's only them that have this tradition. And there are no other Mandalorians anywhere, anytime, that share that tradition of you can't take your helmet off. Now, (laughs) it's, it's, now, uh, so what? (laughs) I think that's what we're getting at, right? Like, there's all this explanation. We're talking about Star Wars, not exactly uh, why we came to church this morning, sit here and talk about Star Wars. Uh, especially something as arbitrary as this guy not removing his helmet. But it's a really big deal, and it opens up, in the story, it opens up all of this, this incredible turmoil in him because he's now realizing that maybe this is the way isn't the way anymore. 
So what does this all have to do with why we're here today? And, and I'm glad you asked. But so what we're going to do in order to answer this, what I'd actually like to do is I, I want to read you something that the Apostle Paul wrote. Okay, he wrote this to the Philippian church a long, long time ago. And although I am going to have it up on the screen, I, I, I don't necessarily want you to read along. You can. You're welcome to read along if you want. But what I really want is for you to hear the Word of God now. I'm going to read it to you, and I want you to hear what Paul is saying, because this is going to help get to my point. So here we are. This is in Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to read from verses 1 to 14. So this is what Paul wrote. He says, whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Now, that's, that's kind of important, right? Whatever happens. So whatever happens, whatever you see, Whatever you, whatever you feel, whatever you experience, whatever you go through, no matter if it's good or bad or anything in between, no matter what's happening, whatever happens, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. Now watch what he does here. He says, watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators that's a really strong word isn't it those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved for we who worship by the spirit of god are the ones who are truly circumcised we rely on what christ jesus has done for us we put no confidence in human effort though i could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could indeed if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight years old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness... I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I, I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, Dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. As followers of Jesus... One of the things that we have to know, we must know, is that locally, like here in this, this particular uh, church building and, and church family, or, or denominationally, even globally, the church is filled with tradition. Absolutely filled with tradition. We have all kinds of traditions, rituals that we take part in, special services that we do, holidays that we observe, styles of worship that we lean into, and much, much, much more. We have all kinds of traditions, don't we? 
So what is Paul saying here? Is he saying that we shouldn't have the traditions? Are we to, are we to get rid of all this stuff? Are we to, to, to forget about traditions altogether? I mean, his words are pretty strongly stated, aren't they? Those are some strong words. Watch out. Well, it is strongly worded and with good reason. Do you have to understand, see, in, in the time that Paul wrote that letter to the, the Philippian church, in the time that he was addressing this issue, there were a bunch of people who were going around teaching others that if you weren't circumcised, you weren't saved. They were saying, like, if, if you don't take part in this tradition of ours, then you're not saved. If you, don't, if you don't do this thing that we do, that we've always done, if you don't do this thing, if you don't take part in this service, if you don't do this ritual, if, you, if you're not taking part in this, this thing that we do as a people, then you're not saved. They're applying their tradition even to, to new believers that weren't Hebrew. Circumcision was, was an ancient Hebrew tradition, a ritual that marked and, and, and identified the children of Abraham, God's holy people. And, and some people were so, like, so locked into the tradition itself that they refused to consider any other possibilities. And so, as I said, they're, they're applying this Hebrew tradition to everybody, even, even the new people coming in that aren't a part of, of the Hebrew family, and they're saying, this is the way. This is how we do it. This is how we've always done it. We're going to keep doing it this way because this is what we've always done. They're saying, this is the way. And Paul's saying, no, it isn't. It is not the way our life is a life of faith in Jesus and what he's done it's not about the things we do because none of it is by human design it's always about Jesus so all all the rituals and all the rites and all the the, the services and all the traditions in and of themselves in and of themselves are worthless they have no value at all now it's important to understand that Paul here, he isn't, he isn't dismissing tradition. He isn't saying that we shouldn't have tradition. Not at all. Not in the least. In fact, he advocates for tradition over and over and over again if you read his letters in the New Testament. So that's not what he's saying. He's dismissing the notion that the power is in the tradition. Do you see that? He is dismissing the notion that tradition is where the power is because the power is in Jesus, not the ritual. The power is in what he's done, not anything that we've done or anything that we do. So we can't live our lives locked into this is the way. Because the truth is Jesus is the way. The trouble with tradition is that it's incredibly easy for us to get lost in the act and lose sight of the purpose behind it. And when that happens, it's kind of like that old bumper sticker that Tracy pointed out to me earlier this week. Tradition is merely peer pressure from the dead, yeah. right? You ever see that before? We all get a sticker like that, put it on our peer pre- Tradition is kind of like peer pressure from the dead. And if that's all we're doing, if we're just doing a thing because that's what we've always done, then we're not, there's no spirit in that. That's habit. That's ritual. That's just that's religion. And the unfortunate truth about tradition is often, that, you know, we recognize something as tradition when it's become a deeply ingrained habit. And a habit is something you never think about. A habit is something you just, you just do. You don't consider it. You don't think about it. And when we as believers lose sight of, of the purpose behind a tradition, we lose sight of the Spirit's intention in that tradition. And when we do that, we're just like the Pharisees. We've taken something that was maybe good and godly at one point, and we've just, we've just made it religion. We've just made it a thing that we do because we do that thing. Now, as I talk about this stuff, and as I was like preparing for this message, and I was thinking about like the things I know about tradition, because tradition's good, but as I was thinking about this, I, I thought of the example that we have in John and Charles Wesley, because they experienced quite a bit with this. I got this with the the old guys, right? Not just old, like really old, like from like long, long. That one's John. That one's Charles. Just 
in case you cared. <laughs> this is John and Charles Wesley. It's a Methodist church. These guys were kind of like the founders of this movement. That's pretty cool to finally see them in person. Well, maybe not in person, but you know what I mean, right? And so here's the thing about John and Charles Wesley. They went through something that was really kind of neat. You see, by the mid-1700s, the time that they lived, about the 1730s actually, uh, music had suddenly changed radically because a new musical instrument had just been invented and it was changing everything. It was, it was called the piano. Nobody had ever heard of this stupid thing before, right? And it was wrecking everything, right? Because they introduced the piano just before this. They had just invented it. And by the 1730s, the piano was actually starting to become popular. People had it. They had them in, in the pubs. They had them in, in, in sort of um, in musical arenas or theater and places like that. They had these pianos, and everybody loved the piano, right? But that wasn't music from church. You see, because the piano wasn't just changing the sound of music it was changing the style of play as well but both john and charles were forward thinking and realizing that if they were going to connect with the culture of that day in a meaningful way they needed to update the sound of church music because people weren't really listening to the same stuff anymore and everybody was being drawn in by this new piano music and so they did something which was pretty radical in that day. So they sat down, mostly Charles, but John helped them too, and, and they wrote a whole bunch of songs. And what they did was they took all the pop songs that were playing in the... No, it doesn't sound like the pop on your radio today. But it was, it was like the popular music of the day. And they sat down and they wrote Christian lyrics to them. And then they went out to the pubs. And while everybody's sitting there, you know, sloshing back their beer and getting all hammered, they would sit in those pubs, play the piano, and play these pop songs with Christian lyrics. Right? And that's what they did. And they wrote hundreds of these things. They just kept going and going. And so they, they kept doing this stuff. And they kept bringing it into the worship experience that they were in charge of as well. They would bring it into the church. And they faced a lot of resistance. They did. There were still many that felt that the old music were the only real hymns. And, and, and they, but they continued to write these modern songs for worship, many of which we still play today. And because of their persistence, they radically changed the sound and style of church music across the entire known world. They broke with tradition. People were saying, this is the way. They said, no, it isn't. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> they introduced all kinds of new stuff, teaching people that the word hymn that we know still, the word hymn comes from the Greek word hymnus, which means Song of praise or praise music. Now, about 100 years later, in the late 1800s, 1872 to be exact, the Methodist hymn book called Hymns and Psalms was published, which included songs like Hark the Herald Angels Sing, right? Jesus, lover of my soul, or, and oh, for a thousand tongues to sing many songs that we know and, and still play and still sing today and with that was this affirmation that we had finally hit a new place where this this new music that people rejected at first was finally accepted as music for church it was finally accepted as hymns but what's interesting is while this is happening and we're finally saying that there's there's very little resistance left we're playing the new music now everybody's really into it and loving the new hymns they would call them and as they were getting into this there was a new type of music that came in the horizon called southern gospel and guess what People didn't like it. That's not church music. We don't play that in here. We can't do that. That's like the old music. Maybe that, that's real church music. But this new, weird, you know, gospel music, that's, that's, not, that's not real church music. That's not, it's not worship. We can't have that in here. And it took this movement decades for, to be, start being accepted and start actually being played in churches. There were very few that started off, but then eventually it began to, to bleed out from the southern U.S. And, and then eventually this, this style of music was accepted all around the world. And then, guess what? It happened again in the 1950s. <laughs> in the 1950s in France, the, 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 the churches in France, they decided they needed to do something. All the young people stopped coming to church. And so what you know what they did is they took a bunch of the, like the pop songs and they wrote 
Christian lyrics for them. <laughs> Sound familiar? Right? And so they started doing this, and they attracted a whole new generation of people to, who, who would willingly come to hear a message about Jesus Christ because the music actually meant something to them. And they could, they could connect on a plane. And so the French were doing something radical, and then it took, it took a while. The Jesus movement helped it, but then it, it took a while. But eventually it got, it got accepted, and it became a part of how we do music and worship because this, this last movement... Is, was the beginning of what we now call the contemporary music or worship music. The same stuff that we play today in church, what we've been playing this morning. Now, my intention wasn't actually to take you through a history lesson in, in music in church, um, but it really is a great illustration of how easily we get locked into tradition just because this is the way. This is the thing we do. This is what we've always done. This is, we'll keep doing this because we've always done it like this. We keep getting locked into things simply because this is what we know. And sometimes I feel it's a little bit funny. Yes, that's a little comic there. Yeah. We never used to have the ram thorn in worship before. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I know. I'll give you a second. I'm going to chuckle about that. But, see, I think it's kind of funny because here we are 300 years later, roughly 300 years later, and the truth is we still have the same battle of tradition that John and Charles Wesley were having back in the early 1700s. I mean, it's like a, it's like a cycle. It keeps, it keeps returning. We keep going through it. And we keep having these tradition wars because it's something that really challenges us. Now, before I go any further, I don't want anybody getting stressed out thinking that I am about to suggest that we stop playing hymns. I am not. We will not. Do you hear me? Okay. I'm not suggesting that. We will not stop playing hymns, or what you refer to as hymns. Truthfully, all music is all church music is hymns. We'll say that, right? Because it means praise music. We're not going to stop doing that. In fact, we value, I personally value the, the incredible depth and, and the incredible, I mean, you think of the spectrum of sound that the Lord has blessed us with in music to worship Him with. Yeah? I love it all. Our worship teams, our worship leaders, they love it all. So I don't want anybody getting freaked out. That's not why I'm, that's not why I'm saying this. We are not going to stop playing the hymns or anything like that. So if that, you had that thought, just get rid of it. Okay? It's gone because that's not the case. But what we won't do is continue to do something. And I mean anything. We're not going to continue to do things just because it was the way we always did it. That's not a good reason to keep a tradition. That's not a good reason to keep a ministry. That's not a good reason to do anything. Because we always did. Traditions that exist because we always did it that way are exactly the kind of thing that takes people completely outside of the will of God. Because it's just a habit at that point. It's just history and God may not be in it at all. Now, I want you to know traditions are good. I spent enough time trashing the tradition thing, right? right? So I want you to hear me. Traditions are good. In fact, John Wesley himself emphasized this fact through what's become known, in, at least in theological circles, as the Wesleyan quadrilateral. Anybody want to try saying that? Yeah, no. Okay, so it's a bigger word than I think you were expecting to hear when you got out, out of bed this morning. The Wesleyan quadrilateral, and I don't want to scare you by it. I know it's a big word, but, but here's the thing. This is what it's all about. You see, Wesley believed that the living core of the Christian faith was revealed in Scripture. Yeah? But it was illuminated by tradition, brought to life in personal experience, and it was confirmed by reason. He insisted, by the way, that Scripture is primary overall, revealing the Word of God so far as it is necessary for salvation. But tradition, tradition plays a huge part in the story of our faith life in Jesus. So what's really going on here in Paul's warning is literally just that. It's a warning. Watch out. 
Paul's saying, pay attention. Think things through. Look at what's happening in your life. Don't take it for granted. Don't just go through the motions. Don't just rely on habit. Think through what's happening in your journey of faith. He's saying, watch out, because there's something to watch out for. He's warning us to be careful about our faith life. It's one of the many reasons why you'll often hear me as I'm preaching say, don't take my word for it. I'm just the guy. Take this back to him and to his word and see what he says about it. You hear me on that? Don't just take my word for these things, please. I really am just the guy. And, and pastor or not, I oh, mean, I mess it up all the time, right? Like, I, I'm just the guy. I, I make mistakes too. There might be a Sunday I come in here and I'm way off base. I, I don't know. I, I, what I love about you is that I get to have the accountability where I know if I mess up really bad, somebody's going to tell me something, right? Just, uh, Pastor, um, you know that thing you said? Uh, yeah, so mm. anyway, <laughs> I love you all. <sighs> Today is really kind of a one-point message, which makes it great because there's really only one point. And, and two, it's really going to be very easy for you to pick up and put into practice in your lives. Because, just like the Mandalorian, this is him with his helmet off, by the way. <laughs> Spoiler alert, too late. Um, just like the Mandalorian learns in the series, and just like what Paul's warning calls us to, we cannot accept traditions built upon this is the way. I'm going to give you a second because this is funny. I heard Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's also the rock. What? Anyway, it's funny. It's funny. <laughs> you see, what we, what we actually really need to get our heads around when it comes to uh, tradition in the church is intentionally asking ourselves and God some very important questions. It's really kind of that simple, just asking some questions like, what do we really, what does uh, this tradition exist for? Why does it exist? Why, why is it maintained? Or like, why do we keep doing this tradition? Why do we keep doing it? Or more importantly, is this something that God wants me to be doing right now? Do we ever ask those questions? I try to, and I forget to sometimes. But don't you think it's important to be asking God, do, God, do you, do you still want me to be doing this? This thing? Was it a season? And we go back and look at what Solomon said about seasons. There's a season for everything. And God has proved that to me time and time and time again. Ministries that we thought were going like, oh man, this is the most amazing thing ever. And then eventually over the years they begin to fizzle out and we don't understand why. It's because sometimes it's just a season for it. And now it's birthed a new season for, for a new thing. God does that all the time. Is this something that God wants me to do right now in my life? We have a lot of tradition in the church, all kinds of different traditions. Some of them were birthed simply out of celebration and, and, and recognition, things like some of the stuff that we do at Christmas time. That's all good. It's all fine. But one of the most disheartening things that I have seen, that I have witnessed since the beginning of COVID, is how quickly and viciously some people are willing to fight about church traditions to the point of division, broken relationship, absence from the body, etc. Despite of it, really none of it having anything to do with Jesus at all. Now tradition, tradition does play a very important part in the path that we walk for Jesus really does. In fact, many of our traditions are an invaluable part of the discipleship process, you know, teaching people about the life in Christ and, and helping them along in that journey. But we must never forget that Jesus came to bring us all back into relationship with the Father and to each other. And if there is anything if any tradition that we hold is subtracting from that or dividing our hearts from Him, then we must be prepared. We must be asking the harder questions. We must be careful to watch out. 
We must walk the journey of faith carefully with caution as Paul teaches us. We have to watch it. We need to always take very seriously the traditions that we take part in even when it's a sacrament. Baptism. Communion. We should never just do anything because, because this is the way. We should always consider very carefully what we're doing and why we're doing it. This is why in 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul wrote this. And I didn't put this up here because I just want you to listen. And I want you to hear that. So please hear this. The Word of God, written by Paul, says, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it into pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So any of you who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthingly is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of our Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. Let us no longer embrace tradition simply because this is the way. But rather, let us be intentional to always walk where Jesus is walking, to, to do what Jesus is doing, to respond to his call, to move with him where he's moving, doing the things that he's doing, to hold tightly to the traditions that God desires for us to maintain and let go of anything that he doesn't. As we prepare our hearts now to receive communion together, Let us take a minute to examine ourselves as Paul encourages us to do. I want to invite you to just quiet your spirit if you're able. If not, I invite you to ask him to help you quiet your spirit. To rest in that stillness before the Lord. In your heart of hearts, ask yourself maybe some of the hard questions. Not, not because you have to, but because in your love for Jesus, you know that this is the path to his peace and his goodness in our lives. Questions maybe like, is my heart in the right place? Is there anything that I'm holding on to, Lord, that, that you want me to let go of? Is there anything, Lord, that I'm not doing that, that you want me to be doing? Is there anything, Father, that I need to repent of so that I can start over right now? right here.